Okay, well, thank you, Andrew. Thank you once again, all of our speakers tonight, for giving their time. Thank you, all of you, for giving your time. Uh, this is the point that um, you're probably looking forward to the most, and I'm fearing the most, um, Q&A session. Um, please bear with me. If I don't spot you straight away, keep your hand up. Um, try and wave, try and attack my attention in some way or another. But um, please hang in there and we will get to you. So um, I would like to open the floor to all of you. And if anyone has any questions, then I'd like to hear from them. I think first gentleman, where you have, and then right hand side there. Uh, David Garner, I'm chair of the Charter Society, and thank you for organising tonight's meeting. Um, uh, I mean, firstly, as a Charter Society, uh, we uh, did uh, we, we did uh, comment on the um, Silver Tunnel in Gannon's Crossing, and our comment was not to oppose it in principle, but was to say we would only support it if it could be proven it would. Uh, deal with the um, chronic air quality issues that we have in Charlton, uh, which partly have demonstrated this evening, uh, that it would reduce traffic overall, um, increasing uh, the modal uh, shift, and it would reduce noise and pollution. And I think that really is where we have to focus the arguments. The real, um, the real issue is the quality of the air that we're breathing. I think Dr. Modway uh, really illustrated that. And I live on Main Road, and my colleague here lives on one of the roads which is um, uh, twice uh, the EU uh, accepted levels of 806 Woolwich Road. Um, so that's the issue we have to deal with. Then we have to link uh, the bridge, or the tunnel rather, and the bridge to that issue and insist that the evidence that it will contribute to reducing air quality, which I don't believe for a moment, but we must make sure that the evidence is there. And we have to raise awareness about the chronic levels of air quality and insist that things are done uh, about it and done about it quickly. And it's not just about tunnels, um, it's actually about living streets as well. And no one, none of the panel tonight has said anything about living streets. Exactly. And living streets is where the non bus routes, if you like, are closed off so you can get and park your car there if you have a car. Uh, but principally, all other streets are not bus routes or main roads, are there for pedestrians, cyclists, you can park your car, neighbours talk, come out. They do their gardens rather than park their cars in their gardens. They, um, children play uh, rather than stay inside. Good for health, people less likely to use cars, and very good for air pollution and so forth. And, and, and I'd like to see some talk about living streets uh, in terms of trying to tackle uh, air quality issues as well as trying to deal with the tunnel issue. I think it needs a, a much wider strategy. We welcome the uh, panelists' view on the uh, living streets proposition. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think you're right. I mean, clearly in London, for the last seven years, there's to be set to, to argue uh, for clean air rather than to be arguing against um, uh, runaways or this or that. Um, you know, we, we want clean air, and I think that's the message. If I, Ian, Ian had his um, very powerful slide <coughs> yellow um, uh, of the breaches of the legal and World Health Organization guidelines, if I was to give you all one message tonight, it is, you know, whatever you think about the tunnel, um, and I don't see any logic for it uh, for the reasons we've heard from others tonight, um, uh, or, or, or extra ferries, but I think if there's one message I would give you is, you know, you know, wind up the council on this subject. You know, why is the council not creating a fuss about these terrible air pollution levels, you know, in Greenwich, in the way that, for example, um, uh, campaigners and, and the council have got wound up in Putney? Why aren't you getting the things they're getting in Putney? And that should include things exactly as you say, like living streets, cleaner buses, walking, cycling, a whole lot of things. And if you focus the council on actually cracking this problem, um, making sure these laws are complied with, the health is protected, you can have a much more pleasant borough um, than we've got today here, but also generally around London. There's a lady in the back second half, Hi, my name is Catherine Beach. I'm really concerned that Boris and TFL are pushing ahead with these plans without having fully considered the alternative options. Can the panel tell us at 
bit about any discussions they've had with TFL or Boris about the alternatives and what they're responsible to see. And perhaps you could say a few words about any cost modelling or modelling of impact of traffic that's been done on the alternative options versus Silver Town Tunnel. Uh, I actually don't know to what extent they've been asked, but I'm pretty certain Darren Johnson will have been asking and that we can look that up and find out. Um, generally, they won't have done a fully costed you know, traffic model on the options. And I think part of campaigning, part of uh, you know, raising fuss and you know, responding to consultations when they do them, but also campaigning outside of the consultations, is to try and find out what they've done. Um, Darren is very good at putting in freedom of information requests. Um, and when they haven't done a proper, a proper assessment, try and force them to do it. Uh, in terms of planning law um, and you know, the regulations of the government, it, if someone hasn't properly considered a viable alternative, that is a good reason to turn down a proposal. Um, the only um, other re in recent um, example of a winning campaign uh, and a public inquiry, which is they're quite unusual, <laughs> um, once they get to a public inquiry, is in George in uh, David Cameron's constituency of Whitney where the local people have put forward, instead of a, a great long new bypass, uh, just a slight change to a junction and extra slip road um, to provide the extra movement that was needed. Um, the, council, uh, the council hadn't assessed that at all, and when the inspector realised that, he threw the road out, um, and they, they are now campaigning to get that slip road. So if you can show that there is a viable alternative, you have to get to a point of showing that it's in some way viable with your own work. Uh, you can then force people to um, assess them themselves properly. Uh, but it is a bit of a, it's, it's tricky. Um, you do need to do a certain amount of work to show that it's likely to be viable before that swings it with an inspector, if you see what I mean. Can I just add to that? To show it viable in a complex city like London, you need to have sophisticated modelling of mm -hmm. people's behaviour, how they'll change modes, because really the alternatives are not a slip road right here, it's a public transport alternatives. Yeah, we're not in rural Whitby. No, and to <laughs> so model a different strategy for East London involving bus lanes all the way down to the side of the river and additional crossings, ferry boats, all those sort of things. There's a lot of work in that which I don't think any amateur can do without the resources of something about TFL. Yeah, I think and they just haven't just done it properly. Well, we, we did, you, you mentioned the, the Thames Gateway Bridge Inquiry. We did ask those sort of questions at Thames Gateway Bridge Inquiry. They haven't done it because they, this, they've had this solution looking for either a problem or now a reason. They haven't actually started from what does East London need? Can we design a, a system to deliver on East London? We've got these two old schemes, we've got congestion at the back of the tunnel, that's the problem, we'll try and solve it by building a bigger road, we know what it will we don't know what it will Or this ancient 1944 scheme of Gavin Threach, where they've got a bank. So, let's start yeah. from that. I should, I should also add, um, politicians and um, <coughs> transport people in general do seem to suffer from what my boss calls uh, big project items, and what I tend to call edifice on the complex which is the idea that a big solution, so they can sign up something giant that will solve all the problems. When actually, when it comes to traffic, it is complex. Often a package of measures, things like information, a bit of public transport here, some cycle network improvements, you know, speed limits, all of those things in one in a big package can make a huge difference. Um, and when I say a big package, I mean one that will still cost about one tenth of what this bridge, this tunnel would cost. Um, those, those are things that are very hard to but often, uh, if you do put them in place, you end up with really, really good results. And I think it's also fair to point out that uh, I'm coming here that uh, I mean, Greenwich Borough is meant to be an air quality management zone, and yet the council's backing a scheme which will completely set back any attempts to improve air quality. Okay, there's a lady right at the back. Um, okay, well, you mentioned about old schemes. I think I'm going to talk a very old scheme, these and river crossing. Uh, which is a few people in this group I recognise as well. But what I'd like to say is everybody who knows anything about that now knows that we lost the public inquiry at the, the 80s and 90s. We lost it completely, they wouldn't build it. The only reason they didn't build it is that a later challenge in the High Court to be made 
on the basis of Oxley's wood. People get confused. They thought we only fought on the wood. We fought the road. We fought the bridge. The wood was the only thing you could take them to court for, because it was a side special scientific interest. We lost that too. The job major government ran out of money and they didn't build the road, so that was good, wasn't it? So, so the East London River Crossing wasn't built. But what I'm trying to say is, look at the bit down the path. Look at the people down the road. Look at the people who are going to have that motorway coming through. It isn't just us in Greenwich. We need to get those people. So like looking down at Oxley's Wood, you didn't just look at that bridge going across the river, but you look right the way down. Look right the way down that path. Look what that motorway coming down for that traffic jam right the way down is going to do. And what it's going to do to the people who live in the boroughs, the road conservative, further down. And what it's going to do to them too. It isn't just our problem here, because I live around the corner here now. So you've got a lot of support. You should have, we should have a lot of support. We're afraid we're a bit tired to take on another road crossing inquiry and thing. And if anyone wants the full transcript of the Extended Road Crossing, it's in my attic. <laughs> so, you know, help yourself. I'm annotated beautifully by the lady who collected it, which is a legal secretary. So God, I've got a lot of information on that. But that's a whole load of support for this campaign that this campaign mustn't lose is what's going to happen down the road as well. Because it won't just stop. Yeah, this, this, it this certainly isn't. Uh, this is certainly all right, the location here tonight is in Greenwich, and the people <coughs> have got a slight sort of Greenwich bias, if you like, from where they came from and collecting the um, information, but this certainly isn't Greenwich only. It is in Greenwich. And the other thing I'd say, the other chapter you've got to find is the people who want this bridge. Uh, this tunnel because they wanted to get to the airport because they're flying to New York now and keep the airport as well. Now we've lost on that one because they've got they've got planes going to New York now, which they never were gonna have when we fought that inquiry. Now there's a lot of people with a lot of money and a lot of influence who want to get to the airport quicker. And they got held up in the traffic at Blackman Tunnel, didn't they? And wouldn't it be better if we could get our flash cars through Blackman Tunnel with them? To get to the airport, so we did miss our plane because they weren't head the DLR. Anyway, the gap would be a bit too much. So that's what you're fighting as well. That's right. It's definitely good. Well, so watch out for that. Yeah. Um, you, you still, it, it's not going to anybody driving a BMW. There's a queue in front. I hope there's not too many yeah. BMW owners. Well, I'm sure there's probably driving a BMW. <laughs> <laughs> there's a queue in front, wide on the road, and it's all but they are now dictating policy. People like that are telling people we need these bigger roads for the economy so we can get to the airport quicker. But they can't see, and they've forgotten, that five years hence they'll have a bigger traffic jam and they won't be able to get anywhere near the airport. And this London is, is definitely different from the rest of the country. The scale is different. You can never solve London's problems by building more road space. You attempt to make them worse. It's just the, 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 the unmet demand for travel is so enormous. You just can't deliver it by a road based strategy. Can I just point out that the point on the, the, the areas further down um, is that the last three in Elton, the very last one we did in Elton, is just outside the uh, Conservative Party office on the uh, West Mount Road in Elton. That's where uh, we thought some um, outer bars didn't need a reminder. Um, my name is Kevin Bonavia, I'm um, a Labour councillor for Blackheath Ward in, uh, in Lewisham. Um, and my question is about consultation, and that's come up a lot again and again tonight. And uh, in my borough, I know that the, uh, the council there has expressed concerns about the impact, um, the wider impact of this scheme uh, going through, particularly my ward in Blackheath. Um, but other people mentioned tonight that we've got to think about alternatives. And so my question is, what kind of consultation is needed? Not, not just, you know, what legally do we need, but what kind of, kind of consultation should we have? Because I think it's all very well for councillors coming up um, with their views on it, but I think, um, I think a lot of the answers with alternatives are going to come from um, the wider public, because some of them may be experts, um, some may not be, some will have 
um, a history in campaigning and, and know what the consequences may be. Um, but if we're going to find real alternatives, I think we need a proper consultation and I'd be grateful to hear from your experience about how we, how we really do that properly. Thank you. Um, this is one of the things that we were looking for actually um, six months ago. Um, the original consultation that TFL put out and the British Council supported um, offered a carrot and didn't actually explain any of the disadvantages. Um, basically, we were told to vote for the bridge and vote for the tunnel. And this will be the solution to all the problems. But one of the reasons that we did our monitoring as far back down as Elton was because we were aware of the jams that were already as it is. When the local council... Excuse me, could you stand up? I'm yeah, sure. Uh, when the local council commissioned a survey into the possibility of taking a DLR route down that corridor of the A2, one of the things that was pointed out was it was almost impossible to widen that road to actually create the capacity for the DLR without a massive scheme of demolition. Now this is what's being proposed. One of the things that's been proposed is widening the tunnel. And that this doesn't solve the problem. So the consultation that is going forward has to address how that traffic is going to be managed. I mean, it, it, if, as Andrew said, you double that capacity through the tunnel, but you don't do anything else with the rest of the roads, it's going to push out all of that traffic, all that congestion, along the A205, down the A2, we're going to jam the way through, and people aren't going to be told this. There's no honesty in this proposal at all. And that's what we need. So how do you challenge the proposal to ensure we get the, the honesty and the suggestions? Um, I, I want to ask a question if that's all right, because it was about, um, you know, how can we do a really wide-ranging consultation here? Um, and I think, you know, that is, that is the right answer. I, mean, I, don't know, I don't know what the right answers are around here, because, um, you know, it's, it could, will come from, from people and organisations who really know. But I did look at the new local transport bodies, which outside London have just taken over. Um, a lot of the transport funding, and we looked around and sort of rated the different ones around the, around the country, and we found that the very best one, the one that had the best choice of schemes, the most imaginative choice of schemes, was Gloucestershire. And Gloucestershire, <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Gloucestershire, I was delighted to find they were passed. Um, and what they did was they started off their process, instead of just hauling out small road schemes from a drawer or going, would you think please, consultation? Um, they said, you know what, anyone can put forward a scheme, you've got an idea, Tell us what you think, tell us what you want to do. So they ended up in their short list of schemes with one that was promoted, uh, proposed by the, the sort of town centre task force of businesses who wanted to redo the station. Brilliant, so that's, that's in there, recent new station, new platform. Uh, they got um, a scheme to break the canal, um, the local bus company put forward exactly where it wanted new bus lanes to improve its service and have figures on how much it would improve its service. Um, if you put out a very wide consultation saying, what can we do to improve things? You just might find that you, you end up with some brilliant ideas and you can put together a package. I mean, what, they reckon they've got 600 and something million to spend? Um, you know, we can put that to good use if we ask people what they really wanted, what would really help. I think, as, um, I think as well, just one last point to add to Sean, that um, one thing which was missing from the TFL consultation was any discussion of anything outside Greater London, so there was a new option, say, to remove the tolling from the, from the Dartford Tunnel, uh, which, you know, we, we, which, which could well lead to some of the problems of uh, traffic coming through the A2 and A102. Yeah, as John Stewart, uh, I think we're going to ask a question, but John, I think the question John, the chairman, and then I was going to make a point. Yeah. 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 It's all right. Okay, we can do that. My name is John Stewart. I, uh, I was very heavily involved as the lady behind with the campaign against Optus Wood and the Blackwall Tunnel in the uh, early 1990s. And I chaired the umbrella body which brought together 250 groups uh, across the country, uh, across London and across the country. Um, what, um, what I'm going to say about alternatives is I, I think, following what Sean's just said, I think the alternatives, the non road alternatives, do need to come from ourselves. Uh, and certainly what we found in the, in, the, in the past is when we put forward non-road alternatives, that opened up the debate. Uh, and, and I think working with uh, um, 
can take a better transport than others, but we may be able to develop non road alternatives which actually come up with answers and traffic answers, which I think will fundamentally <coughs> challenge uh, the, the, the idea of simply building a new road. Just, just two other points, quickly. One is, um, as we said before, I don't think we need to be despondent because the uh, Gallions Reach, East London River Crossing, and several times before has been fought and has been won by local people. Lots of public inquiries, but won by a wider campaign. When the uh, Blackwall Tunnel, which was the predecessor body of the Silver Tunnel Tower, was fought in the 1990s, very similar meetings, both south and north of the river, <coughs> and felt they couldn't win, but local people did win. So it's just, uh, my feeling is, we can, we can win this. The, the other point I want to make is that these days I chair the UK Noise Association, uh, and some of the maps that have been put out by air, on air pollution can be paralleled by, by, by noise hotspots in the areas both north and south of the river. Clearly, we'll be very keen to work with yourselves to bring the noise concern. That's very much. I think just uh, one, one point I would make uh, on alternatives, and I'd just again reiterate so no one forgets, <coughs> please do put pressure on the Greenwich Council to take a real lead in cracking air pollution, because if you don't do that, uh, I think you're really missing a trick. But I think the big, big alternative I would suggest that, that you look at and uh, uh, um, and promote is actually a low emission zone which bans the oldest diesel vehicles, diesel exhaust is carcinogenic, that's classified by the World Health Organization. Berlin, nearly four years ago, banned the oldest diesel vehicles. They're looking at a much tighter version of the scheme in 2015, um, and that's what we ought to be doing. Berlin has got a fantastic just a sort of best of the German sort of approach. Small inputs, big outputs. You pay five euros for, for a sticker on your windscreen. Uh, and the key to making their scheme work is you get one point on your driving license uh, if you drive into the zone when you shouldn't. And their zone is just the middle most polluted part of the city. So what you do is you focus it around the real problem areas rather than actually um, uh, banning vehicles from going from clean air just outside the M25 to clean air just inside it. So that's really what I would encourage you to focus on as an alternative. And that could reduce background levels of traffic by about 30%. Now if you did that, you'd probably have um, enough spare capacity at Blackwood Tunnel or wherever else through the existing links um, to actually let people um, get even in their BMW through to the airport. So I would focus on that, addressing bottlenecks and promoting things like living streets and uh, um, the, this motor shift. Thank you. I know time's ticking on, so if anyone still wants to sign the, um, the contact list as well, and, and you've heard some great ideas of how to get involved, and we'd like to have people involved, then please do. Um, I'll be really here. <coughs> so, can, can, can I just add to the final point? Okay. Purely because I agree with everything you just said, but I think we need to go a bit further. And it's important that you know, and bits of public don't know, that the new diesel engines, which are meant to be cleaner and have lower emissions, aren't performing in the real world. We've tested how they perform in the real world, and they are not producing reduced emissions. The new gasoline engines seem to do what they say you know, on the tin. The new engines are cleaner than the diesel engine. So along with getting rid of the older diesels, we really need to have a shift away from diesel engines completely because that will significantly help us with our NO2 and our biomarkers problems. And I feel very sorry for the general public because you've been sold misinformation and told that the diesel vehicles are the cleaner vehicles. And the reality is that they are not producing the benefits in the real world that they were meant to what the manufacturers have predicted from their artificial testing cycles. And that's a huge problem. It means that when people talk about reducing pollution through technological fixes, it isn't <coughs> at this time. You have to do more than just fix. You have to be bold. I mean, diesel vehicles are responsible for about 90%, 90% of the most harmful pollution. So 
this really is mainly a diesel problem. There's a man in the tech chair. Hi there, my name is James I should work as an air quality consultant. Um, and first, I'd like to congratulate you on getting the um, information from the British Council. It's something I've been looking um, for for several years. Uh, being a local resident as well, and it's a shame that um, you've had to gather in that manner, considering their statutory requirement to uh, produce that information on an annual basis. Um, my question is just a quick one. Um, has an, a sort of official air quality assessment been carried out for this scheme, and where can I find that information? It's been through two consultations, but it's still officially quite an early stage consultation But there will assessment. be an assessment, a full assessment, yeah. 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 I think all this consultation has happened isn't this a good idea? Yeah. But there's, there's no background study <laughs> to show how it will work, what the pollution is. I think that the whole consultation seems to my mind to be terribly premature before they've looked at proper alternatives including a range of public transport type, before they've evaluated those alternatives to see their effect on different people, exactly what um, the London Assembly said in fact, and they shouldn't be having a consultation until they've got their ideas a bit sorted out to something workable, because there's nothing workable that's appeared yet. I just actually got reminded me I was clicking this on the train here. This is the um, consultation uh, response from TFL, where they say they're minded to carry on with the um, consultation. And it says, in the coming months, we want to take further work to determine the traffic, environmental, and regeneration impact and benefits of the possible new river crossings. So, you know, we're starting, we've had two series of consultations already, and we're not even at the stage where TFL themselves have assessed any of the data that we need trying to work on and try to um, present it today, so it kind of says a bit itself. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, Hi, my name is Valerie Wilson Chawa and I'm a resident of Greenwich Peninsula. I've recently moved back to London having spent 15 years living in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, the river width is about the same across Victoria Harbour as the Thames is. I'd like to know if the panel could tell me why so little use is made of the river in terms of ferries and why what there is is so expensive. In Hong Kong, across from Hong Kong from Hong Kong Island to Jim's Joy would be two dollars twenty cents, Hong Kong dollars, which is about twenty pence. It was fascinating as a transport plan how Hong Kong works. Incredibly dense city. Um, there's ferry boats everywhere, and that's one of the suggestions that one would make. If you want to get across uh, East London, don't take a car across the, the Thames of East London, take a ferry boat, but they've got to provide those ferry boats. Um, they've got to focus the rest of the transport infrastructure to cross, which it does in Hong Kong. Uh, the ferry boats are concentrated in places where you can get to, and then get across and get away the other side. Nobody has sort of planned that from the outset. So this is why I say there's no proper strategy for the development of East London with an integrated non-car transport system. The, um, the alternative report does, does assess a bit of the ferry option as well. And again, that's always that's worth looking at. It's from 2008, but it keeps, ferry came up very highly in their assessments, um, like passenger ferry. That's your report. Not my report, no, the, the, the Commission Consultants report. Oh, the Commission Consultants report. Yeah, yeah. 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 But commissioned by Cape Royal Road and Transport. Cape Royal Road, maybe by TFL. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There's a gentleman there, thank you, sir. Hi, I'm a Swanpool line, live on the Woolwich Road down there. I'm one of those black dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I also chair the Charlton Riverside Action Group and uh, do those other things that you may know me. A um, couple of things. I think we need to produce some alternatives. I think it's not going to be done for us. 
but we need to do that, and I think we should all come to take forward today to help whoever and work with whoever to do that. One of the things that's not talked about enough is <coughs> when the Jubilee Line came in, there was going to be a loop down through Western Park, through the Western Park loop. Apparently there's still some workings underneath by North Greenwich, where the extra platform is that will allow that to happen. So that would improve that if we put down here. We need to look at the DLR and its extensions as well. And I think before anything else, we need to work out why Plumstead bus garage, which is where all these polluting diesel vehicles are coming from, the buses anyway, doesn't have any um, of its routes that are on these new better buses. I think we should campaign about that and absolutely try and get TfL to come here and be held to account. It's, it's disgraceful that they won't come and debate with us, because I try uh, locally about the transport system. So I think we should, we should get on. We should all undertake in this room, because we can beat this, but we need to put up alternatives. I, I'm willing to help, I'm sure we all are here, so let's get on there. It's interesting that you, you say that about, um, about the people who um, aren't here to, um, to respond. I think we invited TFL, didn't we? We also invited the, the Labour Council, the, the, um, the leader of the, right, the leader of the council we invited the uh, regeneration cabinet member and we invited the um, public health cabinet member and uh, they're not here. We see a quite wide range of other political, political spectrum the representatives who are really quite interesting that certain people haven't been able to come. Um, in terms of just one moment, just in terms of the actual where we go from here and so on, we've got a couple of ideas that we're going to share with you at the end. And obviously, as you've seen so far, this campaign is review and um, um, with our own um, efforts. And obviously, we are fully aware that this will take more and more momentum to, to be generated. So we will try to in, include all that. Simon, you have a point? Yeah, I just thought to so, say, I mean, touch with the people at Putney. I mean, they've done exactly that. They've had the TfL bus people down on Putney High Street, you know, by the monitors, you know, showing them the stuff, saying, why haven't we got cleaner buses? And they've got them. So, you know, do the same thing. Um, I think that's almost genuine. Thanks. Um, yes, I'm friends of the Open London campaigner, Jenny Bates, and I live in Greenwich as well. And I've been working on this since I moved here in 93. Um, we're involved with the Tent Gate Road Bridge with Sean's colleague um, and some fantastic local campaigners who are also here. On alternatives, um, I think that it has to be TfL who, who run this stuff through their models, which is why we helped get that alternatives report. And the key thing about that, it was supposed to be going through the TfL models. They were having to incorporate that into their work and look at how they could work. Only what happened is that um, Boris then got elected and his uh, manifesto, we had managed to get to, to, for him to scrap that Thames Gateway Bridge. Um, but basically they are required to, to answer questions like, is there a better way to solve this problem? You know, they're supposed to look at how is the, what is the best way? Um, they, they basically put, put out an options paper right at the end of the last consultation um, and it included things that they'd never looked at before, never consulted on, and didn't even give us a chance to comment on those. All the questions were not enabling us to be able to comment on, on those. And um, I actually took them to, you know, started a, a legal proceeding about that, saying, you know, this is unacceptable, you need to restart the consultation so that we can all look at real alternatives. Um, and they basically came back saying, um, anything is still possible, we haven't decided. Any of those things can still come back, so this is premature. So that was their answer. Um, essentially, they have not looked at a package. They haven't put a proper, real alternative package together, which I think should be looked at like a mixture of DLR. You could have much cheaper walking, cycling only bridges across the Thames. And the reason is because if you have um, either, um, you know, for, for traffic, you either have to have it as a tunnel or you have to have it as, a, as quite a high bridge so that the, 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 um, the boats can go underneath. Because, um, you know, otherwise, if they had it as a lifting bridge,
bridge, all the traffic would get backed up when, when um, the bridge was open. So the idea is it has to be high enough so that then the boats can go underneath. And that makes it more expensive. If you have walking and cycling only, you can have it much low level. And it doesn't matter if it, if, it, if it has to lift when a boat comes through, because it doesn't matter if people wait and cycles and, and pedestrians have to wait for a while. You could probably have you know, one or two or three for the cost of doing one of the things we're talking about. Also, a ferry wouldn't just be a ferry, it could be a multi-stop fast ferry. You look at the map of all the regeneration areas, they are on the waterfront, both north and south of the river. You only need a ferry to connect them, walking and cycling bridges. Sustrans suggested a walking and cycling bridge across to the Greenwich Peninsula uh, to Canary Wharf. That should be looked at. It is a combination of those that we need, plus tolling. And if we need it, wider tolling. But, you know, and you could actually redesign the approach to the Blackwood Tunnel so that all the traffic wasn't funneled right up to the, to the approach road. It could be held back, as John has said, there's nothing holding it back, you could stage it further back. And the reason all this is important is because one of the first slides that Sean showed is that for the Thames Gateway Bridge, 94% of the benefits were going to go to road users. And what she, she didn't emphasize is that that was even with two of the six lanes being um, for public transport um, and also with separate walking and cycling. So even with that, you were going to have 94% of the benefits going to road users. And as she said, fewer people were going to walk and cycle. And the reason that is important is, as she said, only a quarter to a third of the people in the wards closest to that scheme had a car. And, um, and it is the most vulnerable and the most disadvantaged who tend to live by the main road who would suffer the most. So they would suffer the most and they would be least likely to have a car. So uh, I, I, I urge us all to work together to, to try and get proper alternatives looked at. Thank you.